The horror genre frequently holds the mirror up to humanity's collective morbid curiosity, exploring ideas of death and bodily destruction in an accessible, entertaining forum. But great horror films may also force viewers to consider how they themselves would act in any given situation, such as tackling a brutal moral dilemma or deciding whether or not to commit a terrifying act for the greater good. So with this in mind, I'm Josh from What Culture Horror, and these are 10 horror movies that force you to answer impossible questions. Number 10. Would you kill your loved ones to spare them a worse fate? The Mist. Frank Darabont's The Mist chronicles the efforts of David Drayton to survive amid an invasion of Lovecraftian monsters upon Earth. The film ends with David and a small band of survivors, including his eight-year-old son Billy, left utterly hopeless when their car runs out of gas shortly after driving past a gigantic skyscraper-sized monster. In this moment, humanity seems doomed to fall to the aliens, and so David and his fellow adult survivors agree to a suicide pact to be spared the horror of being ripped apart by these creatures. So David ends up shooting the three other adults dead, but most agonizingly of all has to kill his own son. Though the outcome for David is even worse, as before he can do himself in, he finds out that the military were literally minutes away from taking control of the invasion, the ending still offers provocative food for thought. In a dire situation, could you bring yourself to spare your loved ones a potentially horrific death by mercy killing them at your own hand, or would you rather wait for them to be torn apart by aliens? Even with all hope abandoned, it's an absolutely impossible choice and one likely to haunt you either way. Number 9. Would you let someone you didn't know die for a million dollars? The Box Donnie Darko director Richard Kelly's 2009 film The Box was hinged on a brilliantly simple premise. If someone showed up at your doorstep and offered you $1 million for pressing a button, but pressing that button would kill one person you didn't know, would you do it? Even with modern society being well aware of the monkey's paw, that is, wishes coming true at major unforeseen costs, the fact that pressing the button would kill someone entirely unknown would potentially allow many to sleep well at night under the maxim of out of sight, out of mind. And yeah, $1 million today may no longer be the enormous fortune it once was, but it's still massively life-changing money for most people, and so the temptation would be tough to resist. Now, while the film ultimately takes this fascinating dilemma and runs away in an altogether less interesting direction, it's still a fantastic provocation. Number 8. Would you sacrifice yourself to save the world for now? The Cabin in the Woods the Cabin in the Woods ends with protagonist Dana and Marty learning that their horrendous ordeal has been part of a ritual intended to appease the Ancient Ones, a collective of malevolent underground deities who require sacrifices in order to remain underground. At the very end, Dana and Marty are told that in order to complete the ritual, Dana would need to kill Marty and in turn save the world. But ultimately, the pair decide to spark up a joint instead and have a front row seat to an Ancient One bursting through the earth, effectively causing the apocalypse. Now there's certainly nothing more noble than laying down your life to save the world. You would be a saviour, albeit one who, per the secret nature of the rituals, would never have their sacrifice recognised. But on the other hand, it's important to remember that this ritual isn't a one-time only thing. In fact, they're required around the world each and every year, which makes the ultimate sacrifice decidedly less appealing. I mean, after all, it's incredibly easy to rationalise that maybe on a long enough timeline, somebody else will eventually cause the Ancient Ones to emerge anyway, so why lay down your life? life at all, especially when you didn't exactly take part voluntarily. Then again, agreeing to be sacrificed would ensure that all your friends and family are spared, at least for a good while, which is pretty compelling motivation to go ahead with it in the first place. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Number 7. Could you kill your child if you thought they were the Antichrist, the Omen? Okay, we're getting into the really tricky weeds now. Horror classic The Omen revolves around American diplomat Robert Thorne, who comes to believe that his son Damien, adopted if that matters, is the Antichrist. At the film's end, with so much evidence pointing to his son being Satan's offspring, Robert makes the drastic decision to stab Damien to death with a ceremonial dagger inside a cathedral. However, he ends up being interrupted by the police, who upon witnessing him preparing to stab an innocent child, shoot him dead. The long and short of it is that killing Damien is absolutely the right thing to do in the grand scheme of human well-being. He is, after all, the Antichrist. It's just that nobody would ever believe your motive, nor thank you for doing it. In the absolute least, you'll end up in jail for the rest of your life, if not killed on the spot like Robert, who sadly wasn't able to complete the grim task, and history will remember you as mentally disturbed at best, and an absolute monster at worst. As much as this scenario is maybe the only one where child murder is the best possible course of action, compared to simply letting the Antichrist run riot on Earth, killing a child general would still weigh enormously heavy on the soul of just about anyone. 
Number six, would you buy a bargain house if an entire family was murdered in it? The Amityville Horror. In both the original 1979 The Amityville Horror and its 2005 remake, the Lutz family moves into their dream home that they managed to snag at a bargain price. The deal came about, however, because a horrendous crime was committed there a year prior, where a man murdered all six members of his family in the middle of the night. While there's of course zero tangible evidence in real life that supernatural forces can possess a person and compel them to murder their family, nobody could be really blamed for not wanting to live in a house where six people were slain just a year before. The ever-present dark cloud of the house's history and the potential for it to become a ghoulish tourist spot ultimately may not make even a massive discount worthwhile. But then again, money talks, doesn't it? And if you can score a massive reduction on your mortgage while putting your dream home's horrific past to the back of your mind, then you're instantly much, much closer to being mortgage-free and maybe even being able to retire early, who knows? So it might not be as straightforward as you think. Number five, could you cut off your own foot to survive? So. Though the filmmakers would love you to believe otherwise, there really aren't that many crushing dilemmas in the Saw franchise. But with its more restrained sense of simplicity compared to its sequels, the original film still presents by far the most difficult question. At the end of this tale, a desperate Dr. Gordon decides to cut off his foot in order to escape Jigsaw's grotty bathroom. We, as the audience members, immediately identify with Gordon and ask ourselves the same question. Would we be able to hack ourselves to bits for the chance of survival? And look, yeah, it's easy to watch this film and just say, of course, you'd do it in a flash, in the same way that I watch hot ones at home from the comfort of my own couch and say with confidence that yeah, I could absolutely smash those hot sauces easy peasy, but in reality, of course, it's a much, much harder thing to do, especially if you want to do it successfully. And that's because it's important to remember that Gordon was a medical doctor with an over-the-odds knowledge of where to cut his foot and how to wrap an effective tourniquet. Even then, without medical assistance, just about anybody would bleed out relatively quickly, so there's far more to consider than just the physical act of cutting your foot off, which, with the slim chances of survival would basically be suicide for most people. But think about the alternative, which is just rotting away in a bathroom until you die of thirst, so ultimately perishing from blood loss is maybe the more merciful of the two choices. And yeah, you could try to get creative like Detective Matthews does in Saw 3 and just smash your foot into unrecognizable paste in order to slip it out of the shackle, but I don't know, either way it seems much easier said than done. It would require an awful amount of luck and grit to crawl your ways to safety. Either decision sounds like hell. Number four, could you kill 30 co-workers to save 30 co-workers? The Belko Experiment. The grim conceit at the heart of the James Gunn pen thriller The Belko Experiment involves 80 employees arriving at work and being told that they must kill 30 of their number within the next two hours or 60 will die at random by way of exploding tracking devices implanted in their heads. Now again, this is another one that seems maybe quite easy. I mean, it's not very nice, but either people successfully participate and 30 of them die or they refuse and 60 die. Again though, it's another one that's easier said than done and having to actually kill 30 other people who don't deserve it is going to take a toll, absolutely. And it would also mean you're accepting to the terms that you've been given when you could just protest as a group and know you are all morally sound and went out together. Or would you be someone who just opts for self-defense and as a final act of protest, refuse to take part, fend off the inevitable attackers and hopefully resign yourself to your fate? There's no real easy answer above hoping that others will simply do the dirty work for you while you hide in the corner somewhere squid game style. Number three, would you take part in The Purge and if so, how? The Purge. The Purge franchise may be wildly uneven, but there's no denying the provocative nature of its delicious premise, offering a ton of moral food for thought. That premise being, of course, on the annual Purge night, all crimes, including murder, are legal for 12 hours, and so audiences are nudged to consider whether they would be compelled to commit crime under the umbrella of legality or simply lock down for the night and hope for the best. Again, it's easy to say that most civilized folk would surely not participate, or in the very least, not actually kill anyone, but it's also fair to say that many, many people morality is not defined strictly by what's illegal. And so, with prohibitions temporarily lifted, we may not all be as noble as we think we are. Now, that's not to say we'd all start murdering our worst enemies or anything, but looting expensive stores, smashing open ATMs, and so on, I mean, who's to say you wouldn't do some petty crimes? On the other hand, though, it's far more likely that these petty crimes wouldn't even be worth it, as the sheer act of being outside on purge night is a massive, massive risk and really opens you up to those proper nutters that are just out there looking to kill and maim and be horrible. So yeah, there's lots of questions when it comes to this one, actually. Number two, could you devour others in order to survive? Let the right one in. 
Let the Right One In is a brilliantly original vampire movie, centered around the burgeoning relationship between vampire Ellie and young boy Oscar. Though the film admittedly doesn't tell us a whole lot of concrete information about Ellie's backstory, they are shown to be reliant on their minder for fresh blood, requiring him to kill random passerbys for them. Ellie will also take matters into their own hands when necessary, killing randomers for sustenance, and obviously this is just pure survival for them. But still, there surely comes a point where you would struggle to justify the growing pile of bodies any longer. More than any other vampire a film which obviously has this premise, Let the Right One In shows the kills to be awkward and clumsy, which must surely only add emotional baggage to the knowledge that your existence is reliant on the deaths of so many other people. Now nobody can say for sure if they'd willingly lay down and die and end their hunger once and for all should they become a vampire, because the motivation to live, especially when you're functionally immortal, would be so strong. Number 1. Would you be willingly drugged to find out what happened to your missing girlfriend, The Vanishing? The masterful 1988 Dutch horror classic The Vanishing follows Rex, whose girlfriend Saskia disappeared from a rest stop three years prior. Despite finding love with a new girlfriend, Rex is still haunted by and obsessed with finding out what happened to his former love, and later in the film is confronted by the man responsible for her disappearance, Raymond. Raymond presents Rex with a drugged cup of coffee and explains that if he drinks it, he will find out what happened to Saskia by experiencing the exact same thing. Though context-free common sense would say that he absolutely positively should not accept the drink, just put yourself in Rex's shoes for a minute. His entire life is pretty much at a standstill as he finds himself unable to move on from Saskia's disappearance. He is frozen in time, unable to truly live anywhere. So even though Raymond's entire everything makes it clear nothing good has happened to Saskia, the power of curiosity is crushing, and in Rex's case causes him to wake up buried alive underground. It's easy to rage in the moment at Rex for basically sending himself to his own doom, but saying no to Raymond would probably be much harder than you think for some one in his shoes. The desire to have some closure, even at a massive risk to himself, would be overpowering. 